of chapter 8. Chapter 8 in Revelation. This is actually week 10, the first part of that. Like I said, we're going to try to finish this in a total of 16 weeks. When I say 16 weeks, it's two parts for each week. So that means you double it. So we're on 10. We still got six more weeks, so that means at least 12 more weeks on nights that we're teaching Revelation. Uh, so just be aware of that, and if we have to, we'll speed read when we get to the very last chapters or whatever. But anyhow, Revelation chapter 8, let's go ahead and get started on this. My camera's on, right? <clears throat> All right. It says, Out of the seventh seal comes the seventh trumpet judgment, and out of the seventh trumpet comes the seven vile judgments. The seven trumpets are divided into groups of four and three. The first four are separated by a flying angel. The first four appear to occur in rapid successions with very little descriptions. But the last three are described with considerable detail. There's a purpose for that, and you'll see that. The first four are visited on places rather than people like the last three which signifies that the last three are actually the wrath of God on man. We've discussed that before. There's a difference between the tribulation part of it and the wrath of God. So the last three is actually the wrath of God because he is causing this on mankind. It's also to be noted that in Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, it said, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees. But here... That has been lifted. It's to be noted that some people believe that the rapture takes place in chapter 7, right before these incidents take place, because this is the beginning of God's wrath. This chapter may be divided into four sections. The first, the silent phase, which is verse 1. The second, the solemn preparation in verse 2. The third, the saints' prayers in verses 3 through 5. And finally, the sinner's punishment in verses 7 through 9 and 21. This chapter is still the tribulation according to the opening of the four trumpets. Verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, they were silenced in heaven about the space of a half an hour. I don't know if I put it in my notes, but uh, many, many people have always said that this particular verse proves there's no women in heaven. Because the Bible said there's silence in heaven for the space of 30 minutes. And uh, can we get a witness that that's hard to tell ever on earth? But can I promise you that is not the real interpretation of that verse. Uh, women will be there. So you don't have to worry about it. Uh, if, if they ain't got on your nerves enough here, they will be there to help you on in eternity. It says, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. We must remember that this seal is open in the sequence after the sixth seal that was in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 7 was just information sealing of the saints and not part of the continual story. Y'all remember I said there's parentheticals all the way through the book of Revelation, parentheses, where he goes in details and then he picks the story back up. In chapters 5 and 6, all of heaven resound with the praises of redeemed men and angels, giving glory to the Lamb. No praise of the four living creatures is heard, and the praise of the elders is interrupted. The saints remain quiet. The silence is mentioned because it's unusual for heaven to be silent. I've often said if you don't like shouting and praising, in the house of God, you don't want to go to heaven. Because, buddy, we're going to do it there. It is the silence of an awesome expectation. Like the nerve-breaking tension of wondering what will happen next. The calm before the storm. An awful hush before the battle. The occasion for this silence is the opening of the last seal. Let me tell you something, folks. When this wrath is so bad that even the angels in heaven is in such awe and in such fear, this is something that mankind has never seen before. It is as if heaven, heaven held its breath 
as they awaited the sounding of the first of the seven trumpets, which followed the breaking of the seventh and the last seal of the scroll. Expectations and suspension can be so intense that one dares not breathe. We often describe such a situation thus, it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Verse 2, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Before the first angel blows the trumpet, we have the assurance from God that in spite of all the dire judgments that are about to fall, God has not forgotten His people and their prayers. Aren't you glad about that? Though it is a long delay, it will be answered by Him. When God said, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord thy God, I will repay. He doesn't forget. In our eyes, it may not be quick enough, but when He brings it, it's going to come to pass. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden incense, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Following the seven angels in their reception of the seven trumpets, another angel came to the golden altar to minister. I have a correction I need to put in here. Some believe that this is the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ ministers both God word and the next word besides and is man word, not man word. Man word. Serving as both priest and judge. Hebrews chapter 4, 14 through 15 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. In Hebrews chapter 6, uh, 20 all the way through 7, 28, talks of Christ being the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And in Hebrews 13, verse 15, it says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Seems to indicate that this angel is none other than Christ in his present ministry as our high priest. You want to know why we sing praises in the house of God? It's because our lips should be giving praises our God. The center is always mentioned in connection with the high priest. Leviticus chapter 16, 12 says, And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. Also in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4 it says, Which hath the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Those that don't know the tables of the covenant is the law, the Ten Commandments, what they had put in there. Even with these scriptures seeing, uh, seeming to prove it is Christ, we must remember that his name is not mentioned. And therefore, we cannot be dogmatic in our position. It seems clear that it could be, but he didn't say it was, and so we can't say it is. This is not the altar where saints are under the altar because the altar of incense. However, there is a connection between the two. According to the Torah, the incense offering were offered up to God as a pleasing aroma. This teaches us that our prayers should be pleasing to God. When someone mixed a strange offering with the incense, it would bring God's judgment or death as seen in the book of Leviticus. You want to know how good we got it in grace? Read Leviticus. That'll help you understand uh, how, how well we got it made now. It is to be noted that this golden altar is located in heaven and is not to be confused with the altar and the temple that will be on earth as seen in Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. 
for he is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And of course, we'll discuss this a little later on in the series. Then in verse 4. And the smoke of incense which came with the prayers of the saints was sent up before God out of the angel's hand. Again, this has been done before the throne, which means that God is in control of this and is approving this. It is also noted that the incense is mixed with the prayers of the saints. We do know from earlier readings in Revelation that the saints were asking God how much longer it would be before he would send vengeance upon the ones who persecuted them. Because this is a mixed incense, as mentioned in verse 3, to me, this represents that God is beginning to avenge his people. Verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. There were voices and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake. This reminisces of Exodus chapter 9, verses 22 through 25. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that they may be held in all the land of Egypt, uh, upon, every, upon man and upon beast, upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod towards heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran along the ground. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt, so there was hell and fire mingled with the hell, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it began a nation. And the hell spoke throughout the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hell that spoke every herb of the field and break every tree of the field. Now, how many remembers of all the plagues and stuff that God gave to Egypt? Y'all remember that? You remember how wicked and how, how terrible it looked that then plagues came down on man. And remember how dis disastrous it was. Remember the screaming and wailing because of all the children, firstborn children, and anything firstborn was killed on that one night. That will look like a birthday party when it comes to the wrath of God. That's why it still gets to my heart when I think that Jesus is about to come. People's going to face this. Some of my own family may face this. Our job is to reach the lost people. Do it at every bit that we can. There is a difference, however. The plagues mentioned in Egypt were to save Israel. for its whole purpose. But the events in the tribulation are to trouble Israel. Remember, Israel had turned her back on the Messiah. So this is to trouble Israel. This can also resemble what happened on Mount Sinai with Moses showing God's rule and laws for the Jews. This could show that God is trying to bring about a change in this world that would be according to what he wants and ruled by him. John wants us to know that this is the judgment that is coming directly from God. These judgments are coming from heaven. However, there is still not the harshest to, uh, this is still not the harshest to come. This is when the vows will be poured out. Generally speaking, the first half of the tribulation includes the seven seals and the first six trumpets. The last half of the tribulation, called the Great Tribulation, is discussed in chapters 15 through chapter 19 under the seven vials. Some people interpret that as bowls. Some of your Bibles will say bowls. God is still trying to get men to repent even during this time. Verse 6, And the seven angels, which had seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. Verse 7, The, four, the first angel sounded, and there followed hell, and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees were burned up, and all green grass were burned up. In modern terms, we could describe this as a nuclear disaster. However, when reading the words, that is, that it is hell mixed in with it, along with blood, it appears to be something that God has done himself through spiritual means. They've got a new movie on Netflix, and it talks about the bomb. Has anyone been watching that series? It would do you good to watch that. It shows what happened when we dropped the atomic bomb on Japan.
Japan. Can I tell you something? I'm not trying to frighten us. But what we did that day, I understand why they did it. They wanted to stop the war. But when they dropped in bombs, hundreds of thousands of innocent children and women were massacred. It trembles me and it frightens me that God one day won't allow that to happen to us. They're threatening nuclear war now. And buddy, what we did, even though we did it with the intentions of good, that should have been planned a little bit better. It should have hit military operations to put them out of business. But never should we kill innocent lives, if at all possible. And it worries me. But this is going to be worse than what you'll see on that film. And that film documentary is amazing. The first trumpet parallels the Old Testament judgments of Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire and brimstone coming from heaven. You can read that in Genesis chapters 18 and 19. But it's also very similar to the seventh plague that came to Egypt. You can read about that in Exodus 9. The one third mentioned here represents that it is not the full judgment of God, but just partial. The purpose is to produce repentance. Many times in scripture, God used judgments to bring about repentance, especially with the children of Israel. Verse 8. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. When looking at the plagues of God sent on Egypt, one of those, if you recall, was that he turned the water into blood. It could be very well that these events mentioned are both natural and supernatural. Verse 9, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Not only would this judgment de uh, decrease man's local food supply, but there would be a reduction in his means of attaining food from distant places, including America, as we depend on imports so greatly nowadays. When COVID took place and when they shut down them arbors, we see that very clearly. At that particular time, people would be willing to pay a hundred bucks just for a roll of toilet tissue. And it's sad that we have gotten ourselves into a situation of America being the greatest country in the world. That we have our rights and we have the ability to produce our own uh, uh, gas. We produced our own vegetables. We did it all. And now we don't even have a factory to make toilet tissue in without it being bought from other countries. Buddy, our economy can turn upside down a lot easier than we can imagine. And this is going to help bring that about. Verse 10, And the third angel sounded, and they fell a great star from heaven, burning as it was a lamp. And it fell the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of the water. This star represents something from the celestial, not necessarily a star. It could be a meteor or an asteroid. It is also to be noted that it must have exploded in many different fragments because it comes upon the waters, not simply in the water. So this is spread it about. Verse 11, in the name of the star is called Wormwood. The third part of the waters became Wormwood. And the men died of the waters because they were made bitter. It is difficult to identify whether this is just some kind of meteorite a disturbance or in fact an angel because God names angels. We know that angels are called stars in the Old Testament or at least in the book of Job. I personally do not view it to be an angel. I believe it's something from the celestial, but I do not believe that it is an angel. Wormwood, which literally means bitter. Wormwood itself is a species of plant noted for its intensely bitter taste and poisonous nature. It is found in Deuteronomy chapter 29, 18, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 4, and in Jeremiah 19, verse 15. In Jeremiah chapter 9, 14 and 15, there's a prophecy that sounded similar to this, which says, but have walked after the imagination of their own hearts and after Balaam, with their fathers, which their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, 
Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood and give them water of gall to drink. It is to be noted that the ecological changes of the earth can cause water to be bitter. For instance, on March the 21st, 1823, a volcanic explosion took place in the Altonian Islands, which caused the water to become bitter and, excuse me, and unfit to use. As we remember, the tribulation gives Christ the right to send judgment on mankind who has turned their backs on him. It is interesting that bitterness is one of the things that he will use since he was on the cross and asked for water and they gave him vinegar to drink with God. You think Christ remembered that day? I think he did. I know it was greatly corrected. I, I know it was gently corrected about a message I once preached when I mentioned karma. Uh, Brother, Brother Bob Drew's son mentioned that, and I mentioned karma. I guess I need to clarify myself. I'm glad when people bring stuff like that to my attention because I talk in the way that I'm thinking and the way I understand it. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm part of uh, beliefs in any kind of witchcraft or any words like that. So let me clarify. I do not believe in karma as it's defined it by the world as some sort of mystical thing. But I do believe that you will reap what you sow. And that's scripture. You reap what you sow. Could it be that this is part of that reaping? Verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them were darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. This is very similar to Exodus chapter 10, when the night plague that came upon Egypt was thick darkness all over the land. It is also similar to the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. There it says, And I behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black in his sackcloth of hair, and the moon became his blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig casteth her untimely figs, and she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the angels departed at, or the heavens departed as the scroll when he's rolled together. And every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. Christ also seems to reveal this in Luke chapter 21, verses 25 through 28. There it says, And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars. And upon the earth distress of nations with perplexities, and the sea and the waves roaring. Men's heart failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. It's also interesting to note that on the fourth day he created the sun, the moon, and the stars into existence to provide light for men. However, under this fourth trumpet, he removed that light. Without the full function of these lights, this will hinder the growth of fruits and vegetables and also disturb the seasons. God has used celestial in the past, for instance, when he brought three days of darkness upon Egypt, halted the earth's rotation in Joshua's day, and reversed the sun's motion for Ezekiel. Verse 13. And I beheld, and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Woe means how awful it's going to be unless man changes and repents. When spoken three times, it means it is increasing and the need to hear it like a horse that may be going over an embankment with you on it. You picture that analogy. Have anyone ever had a horse that ran away with them? Oh, yeah. I have. You pull back on that rein when it ain't too bad, you're just saying, whoa, whoa. But boy, when he starts going on them tree limbs trying to get you off of that thing, 
That's when you're really hard. Whoa! Whoa! That's exactly what God's talking about here. It's going to keep increasing in such, such fierceness that the woes here is a sounding alarm. A loud cry saying, Oh! Whoa! Whoa! whoa. It wants it stopped, but it's not going to stop. <clears throat> this is uh, being spoken to those who are still against God and are not obeying His commandments and repenting. Since some people believe that this is the time of the rapture, the people mentioned here must face the wrath of God, which the, which the child of God has promised not to face. They should have responded before Revelation chapter 7 9, which says, After this, and I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man can number of all nations and kindreds of people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes in their hands. And like I said, before we get into chapter 9, I'm not trying to make you fearful. I know what we've been taught. The average Baptist has been taught years and years and years. We have been taught that there's a pre-tribulation rapture. I'm all for the pre-tribulation rapture. I don't want to go through none of it. None of it. But there is a possibility according to the scriptures, that we could get up to this point. So not to the lows, but through all these other things that man has suffered. Therefore, I plead with you again, please keep your heart right with God, serve Him with all your might, learn to depend on Him. And if that day that comes and we find out we're wrong, and we have to go through the first half of the tribulation period, that we won't be unaware. It's better to be safe than sorry. sorry. Exactly. So, like I said, there's all kinds of interpretations in Revelation. You can say, well, I'm not going to believe that. Well, like I said, the Bible doesn't say, and John went up to church with that. So, therefore, I'm going to take what the Bible does say and heed the warning by being ready. All when he spoke to the churches in that first couple of chapters, he was saying, be ready, be ready, be ready. So that's what we need to do. Revelation chapter 9. The three remaining trumpets announced are also called the three woes. Verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and the hymn was given the key of the bottomless pit. Satan's angels are referred to as stars as well in Revelation chapter 12. Verses 4 through 9. Because the star has the pronoun him, it makes it clear that we're talking about a personality. The difference between worm, wormwood and this one is it called a him. It didn't say it was a star, just a star. Men believe this to be Satan. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. It's found in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. Notice that he was given the key to the bottomless pit. Signifying that someone else was holding the key before it was given to him. When we look back at Revelation chapter 1 verse 18, we can identify who it was that must have held the key before giving it to this person. The scripture says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So to me it was none other than Jesus Christ that gave him the keys again. Verse 2. And he opened the bottom of his pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. This shows darkness is coming upon the earth. The pit would bellow forth smoke that would veil the landscape and the whole sky in darkness, a great swarm of demons. That next page, they've got an artist's rendition of what these may look like. They've been different ideas of what all this is. Uh, we might talk about that. I don't remember. I didn't. It's been a while since I did this part, but there are different kinds of interpretations of what these believe it may be. I personally believe it could definitely be demons themselves that's coming out of this. 
They have been set aside demons for this day. And I believe this could be some of them. And it said in verse 3, there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and upon them was given power, as the scorpions of earth had power. Some believe the locusts are an image of tremendous world war, but the source of inspiration is the abyss. All evil arises from the same source, Satan. Because these demons are released from the pit, pit nations will mobilize and wars will eventually break out. Mankind will be making their decisions out of the guidance of Satan himself. It appears that these locusts were not literal insects but fallen demon beings. These demonic creatures could well be the fallen angels called in Genesis chapter 6 the sons of God or ones originally created by God. I'm going to stop there just for a second. Anyone watch that movie Noah? It's on Netflix too. That movie, although it has a good plot, good meaning maybe behind it, it is so far off the scriptures that it was hard for me to even watch it. If you remember in that movie, they talked about watchers and that they were these angelic beings that was coming down to help mankind. And because they got involved with mankind, God cursed them and turned them into these rocks. They even helped Noah build the ark. Let me tell you right now, that is far, far, far from what the Bible teaches. Now, I don't know what they are called. I don't know if they were called watchers or what, but they were some angels that came down here on earth. And if you read the book of Jude, and we're going to talk about that next, if you read the book of Jude, I've got a book on the book of Jude. Some agree with me, some don't. Some believe that these angels that it talked about are just sons of, 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 of men that were evil. But I personally believe they were angels. I believe they were angels that did not want to like be where they were at in their original state, that they actually came down and they had relationship with women. And I believe these same angels are the ones that taught astrology and everything else. And evil went so fast throughout the world that within a thousand years, God was going to have to destroy it already. You can believe that or you're not. Like I said, it's all up to debate. But I believe this is who these two particular are talking about. Jude chapter 6 states, or Jude chapter 6, Jude verse 6, there's only one chapter, states, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own, own habitation, he meaning God, have preserved into everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of that great day in Revelation chapter 9 11. You say, Brother Roger, <coughs> why do you believe it is not just common man? Because it says they left their own habitation, meaning that they were not happy with where they were ruling. They wanted something different. And it was commanded, verse 4, it said, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men, listen, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. It appears that these demons from hell have a leader. They only have power to attack men. And even in that, they are not allowed to attack the one that God has sealed on their foreheads. Satan has limited power, my friends. Although he may be given a certain amount of power, God can always override the power given to him. We see here how God is protecting these Jewish messengers. If God has commissioned you to do something, listen, no demon in hell can stop you from completing the task. I hear people all the time that profess to be Christians saying, well, the devil's just beating me up. That's because you're allowing the devil to be, beat you up. I'm not saying that the road can't get tough. I'm not saying that the road can't get hard. But the devil ain't going to defeat me because he's already been defeated. Amen. And the one that defeated me is, is part of my family and he's going to take care of me. He said he'd stick it closer than a brother. Amen. So buddy, anytime Satan comes, the Bible tells me that I can resist him in the name of Jesus and he has to flee. So aren't you glad that even in this particular time with the woes coming down, 
When God is beginning to release his, his wrath upon mankind and Satan literally is able to run this place like he wants to run it and he brings his demons out from the, the hardest demons that are not even allowed on our earth today because of the evilness. They come out and yet they still can't touch the saint of God unless God says he can. But if we're protected by an almighty God. So if nothing else in this book right here I can shout because I know I've been preserved against that day. There's nothing that Satan can do to harm me and stop me from what I need to do. Not within my own power. But people, God Almighty in His Spirit, if you're a believer, is living inside of you. You have the power of God on your side. So don't let Satan try to make you feel like that you're going to be conquered. It's not going to happen. Okay, where in the world did I stop? Verse 5? We'll try to get this first. Verse 5, and to them it was given that they should not kill. They should torment five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Anyone ever been stunned by a scorpion? Boy, I have. And I was stunned by one about that big. And I'm telling you, fire hitting on my foot, it felt it went all the way to my brain. It hurt so bad. Can you imagine these large things? These demons and the way they attack and the way that they come against men? Listen to this. Five stands for grace. God's grace comes on to prevent a lifetime of pain. It's interesting to note that the length of this is five months, which is the same amount of time that the, pl the blood prevailed in Genesis chapter 7. Five months incidentally is the lifespan now I thought this was interesting the lifespan of an ordinary locust here on earth. Buddy, you think God doesn't know this creation? You think God don't know what's happening? You think God ain't got all this planned out? We're coming in some bad days. We're already seeing world wars trying to start. Every nation it looks like in the world is after every other nation in the world. And it gets scary, don't it? But I can tell you one thing. It won't be long. It won't be long. Amen. And we don't have to worry about a General MacArthur saying, I'll come again. I'm coming back for you. Oh, I got one greater than General MacArthur. I've got one said, I will return. And I will win this battle. And he's going to do it singing hand. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Uh, they work together real good. Uh, for, for those that doesn't know and haven't been here before, uh, uh, we're, we have this lesson that we've been working on, uh, this little series here on the end time events. We're pretty much just reading it. Uh, they, everybody wanted notes on it, and so we put it together to where you'll be able to have a copy. If you know anyone that would like this course, then it's available. All you got to do is email me. Make sure you give your email address to the secretary. If you get it to me, it's going to last from the time it goes into my pocket to the time I walk out that front door. And then it's going to be gone. So if you want a copy of it, then you go ahead and get them. We're also recording these, so it'll also come with the actual teaching parts of it. I try to just read it so we can get through it, this thing. We've narrowed it down to a total of what's called 16 weeks of class hours, which is actually two weeks per one week with us, because we, we try to do about 39 minutes, which I need to go ahead and set this, about 39 minutes on Sundays to get that done. So just trying to let you know exactly how we're doing this so you're not completely blown out of the way. And I also want to say that there's several that comes out on Sunday nights, and some of them are missing tonight, who are, who are visitors. Uh, they, have, they have their own church on Sunday morning. And I'm grateful for each and every one of them that comes out. Every one of them that comes and visits our churches are just as dear to us as our members of our church. As a matter of fact, they feel like a member. Y'all agree with that? I, I just love it when I see them come through the door. So as far as I remember, according to my book, and I hope you have the same page, I think we got down to page 139. Page 139, I think we got all the way down to verse 6 on that. You should have a scorpion on one side, Revelation 9, 6, 
So if you'll get to that part, is that where we stopped? I think it was. It seemed like it's been a year since we've been back on this thing. All right, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer then, and we'll go ahead and get started. Father, thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for uh, getting us here safe. We thank you for the visitors that come and for the ones that comes on Sunday night who just uh, comes to be a part of these studies and stuff and to be a part of our service who have their own church. Well, they can stay home as well as anybody, uh, but they choose to be faithful in coming, and we appreciate that. So, God, I pray you'll give us what we need this hour. God, make sure that we're ready. Because I really believe that we're in these last days and that we need to be about your business. So, Father, everything you do for us, we'll be careful to give you the honor, glory, and praise when we ask it in Jesus' name. All right. I think I've got our clock going now, so we'll try to stick by that. And then in verse 6, it says, In those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. What this is talking about is people will try to commit suicide, but they will not succeed. Can you imagine being in such suffering? As a matter of fact, people who usually try to commit suicide, they feel like there's no more hope. They've gone through so much pain, they can't handle it anymore. And so therefore, they decide that they're going to head and end their life. They don't know what pain is until we're dealing with this time of, of life. This is going to be serious, serious problems that people are just going to be overwhelmed with and they'll want to die and can't. Uh, we, remember we talked about the scorpions that's going to come and their bite's going to be so fierce and they're going to torment men for like five months. And so these are going to be terrible times and yet they're not going to be able to die. In verse 7 it says, The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. Now, I got a question here. Could they be aliens? You say, well, that's ridiculous. I don't know. This is one thing that I tried to make sure everyone understood when we took this. Like I said, they wanted, uh, the, the church wanted us to do a series on Revelation. And the only way we can do that as far as it, it's college type is we got to bring out all possibilities and now all different ideas as much as we can. Uh, we have set ideas on what we believe in the book of Revelation determined, determined by whether you were studying it under dispensations and different things like that. Depending on who you were under is where you're going to get your conclusions. My job is just to tell you what the book says. And the, the fact is that many of the things that everyone keeps saying is going to happen and, and believes is going to happen, uh, you don't see it in Revelation. We guess it. And so you just got to take Revelation face back of what it says. And, and, and whether this is really talking about that they really look like that or whether it's a type of meaning that their heads has a prickly kind of thing on it that's hard, we don't know. But we do know that they're coming. And, uh, and, and there's been a lot of talk, and I, I'm not downplaying it, I'm not saying it couldn't be, but there's been a lot of talk about aliens. And if you'll ever listen to some of their channels, it's kind of interesting because they claim that these aliens had been here before and that they told men how to develop and how to do this, that, and the other. Can I tell you, I wasn't here in the beginning, so I don't know. I, I know I look like I'm that old, but I wasn't here that long. And uh, so it could be, it could not be. Uh, we don't know, and so it's just faith based. Some also viewed this, and for years and years, this is what I was told, is they were helicopters because it resembled a helicopter in the way that he gave the scripture. you got to remember that when John was giving these scriptures, he didn't even have a flip phone, much less a record phone. So he didn't understand a lot of these things that he was seeing. Uh, can you imagine being born 200 years ago and trying to explain what, what a cell phone is? Or as far as that goes, 200 years ago, what a car is. You know, you got this chariot thing, and you just jump in there, and there's no horses there, no nothing, and you just turn this little knob, and all of a sudden you go flying down the road. How are you going to explain that to somebody? You know, uh, in their eyes, it's, it's something that ate them up and swallowed them in their stomach, and now they go down the road. So this is kind of where he's at. So some thought it was helicopters. Uh, the golden crown shows us that they uh, are uh, authorized to rule. That's what most scholars believe, that they that represents that they have the power to rule. Their faces indicate that they're intelligent creatures, more than simply insects, or animal life. Now remember also I think we mentioned that these could also be demons coming out. We just don't know. Verse 8. They had hair as the hair of women. 
and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. The hair like women could indicate that these demonic entities are attractive and seductive to mankind, and yet they have the lion-like teeth and ferocious with their bite. Verse 9, they had a breastplate, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. The iron-like breast may indicate that they are difficult to attack and destroy. A matter of fact, I would go as far as to say you're not going to be able to destroy them. In my opinion, I don't think you'll be able to destroy them, but that's my opinion. I'm not planning on sticking around to see if my opinion is correct. You don't have to stick around to see if it's correct. But you better know the Lord Jesus Christ is all I can tell you. The wings makes up a great sound to represent how terrifying and demoralizing it is uh, to those who see and hear from them. Anyone ever been in South Georgia and been bit by a no sin? No sin. Huh? Yeah, it's like a nap. It's like a nap, but you can't sit. And I'm telling you right now, the bite of that thing feels like an alligator bit you. It hurts. And you see people going down around the riverbank down there, and they're just smacking the fool out of themselves. Because you can't bite them. You, you just got to wait till they bite. Then that's still going to be just minor compared to what these are going to do. And that's scary. That's scary when you think about that. And they had tails, uh, verse 10, and they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Here we say that they're also equipped with tails like scorpions to torment physically, mentally, and emotionally. This would be what some people call hell on earth. However, with all of this, this is just a glimpse of how bad hell will really be. A matter of fact, this is so bad that you've got to remember going back that they're going to try to kill themselves to get out of it. And some of these people will even know that if they die, they would go to hell. And yet they would rather go to hell than have to go through this kind of pain. Like I keep emphasizing, if you've got loved ones, friends and loved ones that are not saved, by what we're seeing today, we need to be about the Father's business and try to get them to church, and try to get them, uh, or at least witness to them, try to get them saved. Verse 11, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abandon. But the Greek tongue has the same name, Napoleon. Now, see, that's one of the reasons why I personally believe they could be demons. Because the leader's out of the bottomless pit. So to me, that would reckon that they were. Both these in Hebrew and Napoleon in Greek means destroyer. Because the name is mentioned both in Hebrew and in Greek, it signifies that judgment will come upon both Jews and Gentiles. Verse 12, one woe, one woe is passed, and behold, there come two more, or two woes more hereafter. Each woe judgment adds to the intensity of the pain that man will suffer. Verse 13, and the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. My, my, uh, oh my goodness, this thing stopped, stopped counting. I have no idea how far we got. Anybody know when we started? Seven minutes so far? Okay, we'll say about 30 more minutes here. Uh, there are those who take this to mean the same golden uh, altar that the prayers of the saints were asking for vengeance. Verse 14, saying to the sixth angel, which hath the trunk, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. By, what, uh, by watching what is going on in the Middle East, Palestinian is, harmful, uh, is a hateful term, displeasing to God. The root verb is plistim in Hebrew, palas, which means invader, intruder, and trespasser. The same word for Philistines derived from uh, where, uh, who were enemies of God. That is why the Philistines are attacking Israel now, because they are enemies of God's people. The problem we have in America, and I hate to say it, but we like to get our nose in everybody's business. When it comes to Israel, we better be behind Israel. God's word makes that very clear. We need to be behind Israel. And they made this big issue. I don't know if you're watching the news, but they made this big Israel because Israel made a mistake and killed less than 10 civilians. 
And the whole world, including the United States, is upset about that. Me and Drew was talking about how this world is twisted in their thinking. Now they're having a big fit about this and they're wanting to kind of turn against Israel, but they have no problem and they don't mention about Hamas is going around and killing these babies and torturing people and all this other stuff. What they're doing is much worse than what Israel's doing and they keep failing to remember to, that Israel didn't start this. They started it. And I hope to God we still got leaders that's in our government that has a backbone that if someone attacks this country, we're not going to stop until we end the enemy. You say, well, that sounds mean. No, it's what you do when you love people and you want to protect your house. If you come to my house and you're trying to break in, you're going to be met with something you don't want to see. And I'm not going to stand there with no baseball bat. I've got something that will put you down. So you do not want to come to my house. And I'm not going to have mercy on you because I don't know what you're there for. That being said, if any of y'all come to visit, please call me ahead of time. I'm on the door. Say, hey, this is Brother such and such. This is Sister such and such. I don't want to have to go to jail for something that I really didn't mean to do. But this is a war that's been going on for a long time. This is between family members. You don't want to get involved with something with family. But if you're going to get on Bob, you better get on the side where your nose going to win. It takes a fool to fight a battle when, you, when the other part is destined to lose. I want to be on the winning side. You say that you, you believe this is going to win. Yes, sir, I do, because I know who's in charge. Their commander-in-chief has not been defeated yet, nor will he be. So I want to be on their side, and we need to be on their side. The great the Euphrates River was the boundary of territory that God gave Israel. See that in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. The Euphrates is connected with the judgment and tribulation period, as is clear from the second woe, and is also mentioned in the day of the Lord at Armageddon in Revelation chapter 16, 13 through 16, and Jeremiah chapter 46, 4 through 10. It is interesting to note that the river of Euphrates was one of the rivers that came out of the Garden of Eden. It is near the river Euphrates where Satan first caused man to fall from grace by tempting Adam and Eve. It was near the river Euphrates where Cain slew Abel, the first murderer. It was also near the river Euphrates that Babylon and Babel first raised their heads and will ultimately be revived. Could it be that God is returning to where sin birth took place to bring this all to a conclusion? Some scholars believe that the mentioning of Euphrates suggests that this section deals with political events in Iran and Iraq. While this comes to my mind, y'all know how I am, I forget just that quick. So while this comes to my mind, I want to go ahead and mention this to, just to let you know how close we are. Everyone knows, right, that we're going to go to a Catholic society. The Bible talks about it. It's going to get to a time where we're going to have a one world government. We'll have a one world money. I read something the other day that, that uh, like I said, made that one hair on my head stick straight up. They talked about the euro. They said within the next five years, they're going to swap the euro to digital. You say, what difference does that matter? It makes all the difference in the world. We trade with Europe. In order for us to have business with Europe, then we're going to have to go some form of digital as well. The whole world is going to eventually go to it. And then Iris said, well, we're not ready for that. It may be about 10 years down the road. That's how close we are, folks. It's getting close. It's fixed to get down to where we'll have that one world money and they can be able to keep up with what's going on. What's the purpose of the digital, digital currency? The purpose is is because they can be able to tell what all you're doing with your money. Not only can they tell, but if it's inside that system, they can stop you from getting yours. And once they stop you from getting yours, that's also been prophesied because the Bible said that we won't worship the beast and take his mark that you won't be able to buy or sell. The reason I said that I know that we're toward the end of days is because a hundred years ago, people were scratching their heads and said, well, I don't understand how that could be. I don't understand that, how that could be. But if you don't have no real money and it's all on the computer and it's all fake, that's how it can be. They'll know exactly where you are, what you're spending, and everything else. So I thought I'd throw that out there just to let you know 
that we are definitely in the last days as far as I'm concerned. Verse 15, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. Showing the fact that God indeed is working on a time clock. He has everything planned exactly on time. Not one time I say over and over, not one time has God ever said, oops, I didn't see that coming. He knows it. He's got it. Verse 16, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousands. And I've heard the number of them. There are many ideas about who this 200 million strong army is. Some see the 200 million as China and view their dragon as a sign of the devil. Good possibility. There are other ideas of who this is, many of which believe its armies coming from the east or even groups of people like the Muslims. That's another good idea. So we just don't know who they are. Lance Larkin believes it to be a supernatural army. Supernatural armies are not unknown to the scriptures. Horses in a chariot of fire separated Elijah and Elisha. In the day when Elijah was taken up by a whirlwind in heaven. 2 Kings chapter 2, 11. When Dothan was besieged by the army of Syria, God opened the eyes of Elijah's servant and he saw the mountains around the city full of uh, horses. I don't know what kind of spelling that was. The horses and chariots of fire. 2 Kings chapter 6, 13 through 17. When the Lord Jesus Christ shall come to take the kingdom, he will be attended by the armies of heaven riding on white horses. A lot of times we get very upset because we feel like God's not listening us and God don't know what's going on. Sometimes I wish God would open up our eyes just so that we can see what all surrounded us. We're in a spiritual battle. The Bible says we're in a spiritual battle. That's what we wrestle against. That's what we fight against. But trust me, he's got his angels surrounding us. He's got his angels. So we don't need to worry about that. Regardless of whether these are demons or actual armies of men, they are demonically inspired. Verse 17. And thus I saw the horse truck, and, and thus I saw the horses in the vision, and then they sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and a jacket, a reddish, which is a reddish orange gem, a variety of zacron. And brim and brimstone, and heads of the horses, whereas the heads of lions, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. This represents judgment and hell. Verse 18. By these three was the third part of men killed by fire and by smoke and by brimstone which issued out of their mouth. Let's take a moment to look at the statistics of those who are being killed. When you look at chapter 9, verse 15, these four angels were loose for a certain number of days to slay a third part of men, leaving two-thirds left. However, when you look back in chapter 6, verse 8, at the opening of the fourth seal, Death and Hades had the power given to, to them to kill a fourth part of the earth with the sword. So their one-fourth of humanity has already been taken away in death, which leaves one-half of the earth's population destroyed. One-half. Uh, then verse 19, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were likened to serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Serpents relate to the serpent in the garden which brought sin and destruction. Let me stop there too because another thought came into my mind. Remember we had already talked, I believe, I think we talked about it, about the uh, 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 wormwood coming. A lot of believe that that's an asteroid. And I said that it's evidently going to have to break up because it's not going to hit one particular area. It's going to hit all the waters around that area that he said it's going to hit. So obviously it's going to break up and we wonder how could that happen. That was another thing I was reading about. Boy, when you know Revelation, it gets exciting to read the news. People say there is no God. Read Revelation and then watch the news. There's a God. But they're talking about there's an asteroid right now heading towards Earth that is the size of the Empire State Building. And guess what the scientists and their bright ideas are going to do? They're going to bomb it to try to break it up. That could just be wormwood coming and fulfilling God's promise. You know what's funny about man? They may not believe in God. They may not accept what God says and does. 
But in all reality, they fulfill his plan. You remember Pharaoh? Yeah. Pharaoh sitting there trying his best to defy God. Defy God. Defy God. All he did was fulfill every promise God said he's going to do. The enemy don't have a chance, folks. We don't, we don't have to be lollybagging around and make like we're discouraged and, and defeated. We're not. We're more than conquerors. Verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by the plagues yet repented not for their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. God was using all the things in these woes to bring repentance but man still refused to repent even though half of the population has been destroyed up to this point. They chose death over life. You say, how in the world can that happen? We've already seen it happen in America. You say, how so? How many remembers the Twin Tires? How many remembers the Sunday right after the Twin Tires? We didn't have to worry about filling up the church. It was full. People were down on the altar. They were begging God to save them. They were doing all these things. But once God had brought us through that, it was less than six months the churches was empty again. They didn't no longer care about God. A matter of fact, right after six months after that, they came an attack on Christianity, attack on the Bible, attack on anything that was godly, that was in government buildings or anything like that, and they deliberately removed it, saying they didn't want no part of it. That goes to show even in our own history that God sends things to wake us up. But buddy, when their heart's bent towards evil, they're going to go back to evil. They're not worried about it. And trust me, he's fixing to send things to America. That's one thing that we was talking about too with Drew. God, when we look at America, America is going to probably see a judgment like no other nation has ever seen. Now, granted, I would say any nation that would be in comparison would be what the Jews had suffered. Because the Jews rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Remember, we had mentioned that they said, let his blood be upon us. And they have suffered ever since they made that statement. The reason America would be judged worse than most every other nation in the world is because for 200 years plus, we have been taught the Bible. We have been taught God's principles. We have been taught to live by God's principles. This nation was built upon God's principles. And yet we have thumbed our nose at God and said, we don't want you. Buddy, when you've got that kind of knowledge, when you've got that kind of wisdom, when God has been that merciful, when God has been that graceful to you, trust me, the judgment is going to be hard. Because if you've got much knowledge, then you've got to, you've got to pay for that, for not using that knowledge. Verse 21. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorcerers, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Sorcerers, of course, the J.S. Uh, South refers to impure practices with evil agencies and particularly with poisoning, poisonous drugs. The word includes tampering with oneself and, uh, or another health by means of drugs, potions, intoxications, and often with magical arts and incantations along with invocations of the spiritual agencies. Fornication is a fragrant disregard for the sect sect uh, sanctity of marriage. We're through chapter 9. We're moving right along. Revelation chapter 10. Each of the four divisions found in six, chapter 6 through uh, 19 includes a parenthetical inserted. Chapter 7 was inserted and dealt with the people Whereas here it deals with places. This interjection is placed between the sixth and the seventh trumpets. The exact time given in this parenthesis is unclear. The references found in verse 7 to the seventh trumpet doesn't help the understanding. This statement refers to the seventh trump in the future sense and does not indicate how much time takes place in the intervening. However, chapter 11, which is also part of the parenthesis, uh, does offer a definite time reference. In verse 2 through 7, we learn there are 42 months before the beast arises out of the bottomless pit. Since this occurs at the midway point, verses 1 through 14 must cover the first half of the tribulation. This would place all of chapter 10 as an introduction to the seven years of the remainder of the parentheses Chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, in the first three and one half years. Clear as mud? Everybody got that one? All right, verse 1. 
And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with the cloud and the rainbow was upon his head. His face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Some teach that this angel is Christ and others that it is not. Here is a list of why some believe it is Christ. He is clothed with the cloud. A cloud is often mentioned in connection with the appearance of Christ. Daniel chapter 7, 13. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Matthew 26, 4. Acts 1, 9. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And Revelation 1, 7. Number two, he has a rainbow upon his head. There are only three other references to a rainbow. And all of them are mentioned in context with God. Isn't it funny that the gays decided to use a rainbow as their symbol? A direct defiance of God Almighty. A direct defiance. And all of them are mentioned in context with God in Genesis chapter 9, 11 through 15, Ezekiel 1, 28, and Revelation 4, 3. Number three, uh, number three, I almost said that half in Spanish. Uh, his face was as it were the sun, matching both uh, Matthew chapter 17, 2 and Revelation chapter 1, 16. Number four, his feet were as pillars of fire, similar to the description found in Revelation chapter 1, verse 15. In verse 3, he cries as a lion roared, and Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation chapter three five or chapter five verse five. Number six. In verse three he refers to the two witnesses as my witnesses. But here are some of the reasons why it may not be Christ. That's why I keep emphasizing if the Bible is not clear, you cannot be dogmatic in your stance. You can have your opinion, but if the Bible's not clear, if it doesn't say this is what it is, you have to take it at face value. Number one, there's no record of Christ appearing as an angel after his incarnation. Number two, verse one says John saw another mighty angel, suggesting that this angel is the same as some of the other angels, not personification of Jesus Christ. Number three, in Revelation chapter 18, one, there's another angel whose glory is enough to brighten the earth with no indication that this angel is Christ. In verse six, he swears by the creator, and the lesser always swears by the greater. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16. By this oath, the angel acknowledges that God is infinitely greater than he is. The Bible said when Jesus talked, he said, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Satan has always in, in, imitated the things of God, number five. When it says from heaven, this angel is the first of the angels to descend from heaven. In the vision of the seal, the angel comes from the east. The cloud was of old, the garment of divine presence, and was associated with divine movement. Exodus chapter 13, 21. Exodus 16, 10. Exodus 9, 19, or 9, verse 9 and 16. And Exodus 40, verse 34. The rainbow is the promise that God will no longer destroy the world by water. It's also a reminder of the promise God had made to the Jews. It also serves mercy in the midst of judgment, symbolizing the security for the believing ones. His feet as a pillar of fire represents judgment. Verse 2, and he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. Some believe this to be the book of Daniel. The reason behind this assumption is that the book of Daniel is one little book within a big book of 66 books. Thank God hadn't got a plan. Some believe that the sea is full of turbulence and the land is stable, meaning that God will bring all things together, signifying the beast will be coming out of the sea to the land. When it talks about him setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot upon the earth, there is no evidence that this is anything other than a literal act performed by this angel. The placing of his feet on the sea and the land uh, could be him, be it Christ or the Antichrist, claiming the right to the world dominion over the land and the sea. It could also be used as a final proof that this angel is not Jesus. Christ will not set his foot on the earth until the second advent 
on the Mount of Olives. You see how all this can get confusing? You've got to take everything in its context. Verse 3. Cry with a loud voice, and when the lion roared, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. The thunder is to get our attention. The roaring is not from fear, but a shout of power to impact terror. The final sound before the lion attacks its prey. Verse 4, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Set up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. In John chapter 12, verses 28 through 29, when the Father spoke from heaven to Christ on earth, the words were not uh, discernible to those who heard the sound. Nevertheless, Jesus uh, understood the voice because it was meant for him to hear. Perhaps when God calls from heaven, it will be a sound like thunder to unbelievers. But we will hear our new name as clearly as Christ understood the voice of his Father. I have a good feeling that that's a correct interpretation on that. I don't think God has ever hid anything from his children. He's always tried to explain to us what's going on. Some believe that the words seal up or vote are there to let us know that this is uh, concerning Daniel's prophecy. This is the only person of the book of Revelation that is sealed. In fact, John is told in Revelation chapter 22, 10, not to seal up the sayings of the prophecy. Apparently, these words will not be revealed until the very end. Verse 5. The angel which I saw uh, stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. The lifting up of the hand could represent an oath that God will bring about what he has promised. The sea and the land could stand for the sum total of the material universe. Verse 6. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein are and the earth and the things that uh, therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. No more time signifies that there will be no more delay. He's not saying that time's going to end. He means there'll be no more delay in what's going to be taking place. That which was promised of judgment is about to come quickly, along with bringing Israel's redemption. Remember, Christ's purpose is taking dominion of the earth, uh, is that he might give it to his saints. This is the promise that he had made all the way back when he said he had set up the Davidic uh, kingdom. It might have been a thousand years ago, but God's still faithful on his promises. The words of this chapter are a general overview of major events of Daniel's 70th week. The use of the ver uh, future verb should, in verse 6, allow this particular statement to have some future reference. The answer may lie in the mysterious ceiling mentioned in verse 4. The angel had sealed up these words or those words and follows it up with the fact that at some point there will be no more time. This could easily refer to the end of the millennium. Verse 7, but in those days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophet. The mystery of God is Israel coming back to God, to the Messiah, and them entering into their kingdom. That's the mystery. Others take this mystery to be the church, and also the Holy Spirit, which holds back the devastating evil and wrath until he was removed from the earth. I think a portion of that is true. I don't believe that all this wicked stuff can come as long as the Holy Spirit is here. But when that Holy Spirit is removed, buddy, it's Satan ball again. He does what he wants. The prophets in the Old Testament shed much light on end time events and should be studied. Matter of fact, when you begin to read a lot of that, that's what they say. They, they study the prophets. We, we, in America, we don't study the prophets that much, the major or the minors. It would do us good to really get in there and study those different prophets. By the time the seventh trumpet sounds, all things will have been revealed to his servants, the prophets, and there will be no more mysteries. The total and complete meaning of all of Daniel's and John's writing will have been shown. Verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon 
the earth. The little book is a divine revelation pertaining to the final judgments in the second coming of Christ to reign. Verse 9. And I went unto the angel, and he said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. The phrase, eat the little scroll, uh, is a Hebrewism, an expression uh, distinctive of the Hebrew language for the uh, reception of knowledge. It is a sweet message of deliverance to believers, but a bitter message of damnation to the unbelievers. Another interpretation is the sweet uh, is the sweet is the kingdom of God declared. The sour is more judgment to come. In Exodus 15, the Israelites came to a bitter water. Moses cried out to God. God showed him a piece of wood and told Moses to put it into the water. And immediately the water was made sweet. And the Israelites were able to drink it. It is interesting to note that the brain spoken of in Exodus means tree of life. Like I said, God really put this book together, didn't he? It is only Christ, the root of David, that can transform our bitter life and turn it into rivers of life flowing from out of our belly. Can we get a good amen on that? Amen. Verse 10. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Verse 11, and I said, uh, and he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. After John eats the book, he is told his ministry is not yet finished. Some teachers have taught that this means he would be released from Patmos. However, the text of prophesying again before many people, nations, tongues, and kings was fulfilled by the writing of the book of Revelation. We're going to go ahead and stop there. We're out of time anyhow. And we'll start back when we come back in uh, Revelation chapter 11. The main thing that I think, and, I, and I'll say this over and over and over, I think the main thing we need to get out of the book of Revelation is not trying to understand every single thing. Sufficient is the day thereof. It'll come to us as we need it. But the main thing we need to understand is we don't have time to plan. I keep saying that over and over. Buddy, as a church, I, listen, I love this church. I love the people that's in this church. I think that we uh, are a loving church. I think that we have a zeal and a desire that God moves upon our life. Y'all agree with that? Amen. I believe that. But, buddy, I'm telling you, I can't emphasize enough that we really need to be about the Father's business. That's why I say over and over, we don't have time to have idiosyncrasies and get upset about every little thing. There's bigger things in store that we need to tend to. Our main goal should make sure that the lost are being saved. So I hope you enjoyed your nice lesson, and I hope you're getting something out of this. And like I said, we're going to try our best to get through in that 16 weeks. I believe we're going to be able to do it. Uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer then, and we'll be dismissed. Has anyone got anything they need to say first before we dismiss? Nobody. All right. We used to say, speak now, forever hold your peace. Nobody. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you once again for all your blessings today. God, I thank you for this morning. I just felt such a sweet anointing and a freedom to be able to speak. God, I love it when you show up. God, if it ain't for you, then we, we don't have anything. We was talking earlier, Father, that we, we never would be cut out to be a sophisticated church. we just a bunch of old country people that love you. And I'm glad that we are. I'm glad that I know you as my personal Savior, Lord. I'm so glad that you looked down upon me, a nobody, and said, I'll take you and I'll make you one of my own. And we just thank you for that. And God, I thank you once again for these visitors and the people that comes out that has their own church but yet comes out and visits with us on Sunday night. Thank you for that. And God, I pray you'll continue to draw people in. But God, if no more comes in, God, I pray that the ones that are here would be better equipped to do your work and be found doing your business. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, you allowed John to write this and open up this vision for our time so that we could understand what we're fixing to face and know how to warn people about what's to come. We just pray you'll keep us safe as we go our way until we come back again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.